This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, time to put down that phone, let out the recliner, and spend the next half hour with us. No Kenny this week, but he sends his regards and put me in charge of this, a little ditty we call The Rundown. Coming up, tough time to be a farmer, isn't it? Well, American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval feels your pain. His thoughts on the current state of ag and what he says will help lower input costs. Of course, another major concern here in Georgia is the bird flu, but as we have already seen, the Department of Ag has the tools and resources to quickly and efficiently contain and mitigate any outbreaks. And then later, this video might be in slow motion, but the farmer in it likes to go really, really fast. The monitor travels to Miller County and talks horsepower with peanut farmer Jeff Atkinson. These stories and so much more are starting right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, needless to say, it has been a uniquely challenging year for the ag industry. Record high input costs, disruptions of the supply chain. Sounds like a broken record, right? Well, recently, Damon Jones spoke with American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval at his home in Greene County about the issues at hand and whether or not there are possible solutions on the horizon. It's a very tumultuous time to be a farmer as the cost of doing business has reached an all-time high. And with the commodity markets unable to keep up with that inflation, a real crisis could be on hand in the near future. Commodity prices hasn't spread all across the board because I'm in the cattle and chicken industry. We haven't seen any increases here and we still have to buy inputs like fertilizer and diesel and everything else. So it's not across the board total commodity support for everything, but that's going to be key. If, if commodity prices was to fall and we have availability and price issues in 2023, it could be absolutely disastrous and could really cause a huge food shortage in our country and our world. Consumers are already starting to feel the impact as prices at the grocery store have jumped nearly 10 percent since last year. However, despite common misconception, it's not the farmers that are benefiting. It is a big concern because you see those increases and then it, it actually gives us a, a, a bad name or looks bad on us, but we're not receiving that. It's still nine cents out of every dollar somebody spends at the grocery store. I think it's nine cents, somewhere between nine and 14 gets, cents gets back to the farmer. And, and with the prices that we're having to pay for stuff and the prices they're getting for it on the shelf, something is, is missing in the middle. As for what can be done to combat some of these problems, Duval believes becoming less reliant on foreign countries for natural resources would be a good start. But really and truly, we need to be able to look at our policies and make sure we lead in a direction that helps us become energy independent again. And that will change a lot of lives across America. And it will really lower a lot of the input costs because there's a lot of energy used to make fertilizer and a lot of energy used to work in our fields and taking care of our animals. That will be one of the main issues addressed in the upcoming Farm Bill. It's a piece of legislation that AFBF is already hard at work on as it will greatly impact everyone's way of life. It's crucial to making sure that the most vulnerable people in our country get fed, being the elderly and the children. It's a crucial to farm programs and farmers being sustainable, whether it be uh, climate sustainable or whether it be uh, financially sustainable. And then it's crucial to our rural communities to make sure that we do this again, refresh it and get it done in a timely manner. Uh, it, it helps, uh, it affects every American's life. However, making the necessary changes will require a team effort, which is why Duval encourages every single farmer to make their voice heard. Make sure that you're an involved Farm Bureau member because your voice is the most important voice in our organization. You are the most important person in our organization and without your involvement we can't accomplish our mission of providing that one united voice for American agriculture. Reporting from Greene County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Speaking of the Farm Bill, while discussions are ongoing, Sam Kiefer, American Farm Bureau VP of Public Policy, says lawmakers are in the process of gathering information. In a recent interview, he outlined the early priorities Farm Bureau members want to see in the next bill. 
we're focused on maintaining and strengthening the important risk management tools. We're also focused on working land conservation and other mechanisms that provide both an environmental benefit and the ability for food production. We're also going to make sure that rural America has the connectivity and the tools it needs to compete in a digital era. Lastly, but certainly not least, we're going to be focused on making sure this farm bill is bipartisan. Meantime, the Georgia Department of Agriculture and other state agencies are being praised for their quick response after the highly pathogenic avian influenza, a.k.a. the bird flu, was discovered in a backyard flock in Toombs County. Over Memorial Day weekend, the Ag Department received a call from a non-commercial producer alerting them of the possibility of the virus when he noticed birds in his flock were becoming ill and dying. Commissioner Gary Black says within 48 hours of teams being dispatched, tests were performed, the presence of AI confirmed, and the birds, about 350 of them, euthanized. Neighboring commercial poultry operations were also tested. So far, those results have come back negative. Despite the containment, Commissioner Black says now is not the time to relax. In fact, he is urging poultry producers to remain vigilant with their ongoing biosecurity measures. Uh, that message of biosecurity to the producer and throughout the, uh, the poultry industry and backyard flock owners is uh, there, there is no such thing as a day off when it comes to biosecurity. And, and, and uh, likewise, it would not be such a, a day off for this department and being prepared to respond to should there be another, uh, another event. Any questions or concerns you may have about AI or if you suspect that your birds have avian influenza, you can call the AI hotline at 770-766-6850. Testing is free through the Georgia Poultry Lab Network. Build it and they will come. That was certainly the case for the Wright family when they took a leap of faith and opened Wright's Meat Processing in Somerville. John Holcomb with the story from Chattooga County. In northwest Georgia, at this family-run meat processing operation, the meat business is no doubt serious business for the Wright family. As they work to provide high-quality custom-cut and retail services for producers and consumers in the area, it's certainly been quite the adventure for them, but it's one they're extremely grateful for as they've gotten to see their dream come to fruition. We're a custom processing facility, and now we're USDA uh, licensed and inspected. Uh, so if somebody wanted to bring us a pork or a beef and kill it under inspection, they would be able to, to sell that product themselves at flea markets and whatever. But um, that's what we do here. We custom cut uh, everything to order. Uh, and may, we make our own sausage and sell that out retail too at the front. We've always wanted to work with our boys. We have two boys and their significant others work with us as well. And um, that just means a lot. You can, you're not tied to a time clock. I mean, we still work hard and get everything done, but we're not um, punching a clock. We don't have to ask for, you know, vacation time. Uh, we get to spend every day together. Of course, it is hard at times to work with your family. It, it always is but it's rewarding at the end. Being livestock producers themselves, the Wrights saw the need for a processor in the area as consumer demand for locally grown and processed meat has grown exponentially over the past few years, not to mention the difficulties finding meat due to the pandemic and supply chain issues. There's not enough processors for the demand. With COVID hitting, you know, the, we couldn't get to the grocery stores, um, even now, two years later, the supply and the demand is just, you can't find, you can't find the food. Things are out of stock. Um, we are thankful that we are able to open this up for the community so that they can provide for themselves. Um, they can kill their own animals, you know, their beef and their hogs, um, put it up in the freezer, not worry about they get, if they can get to the grocery store, uh, well, if they even have it in the grocery store. We serve a, a niche here um, with all the supply chain problems and uh, rumors of food shortages. Uh, I, I like, you know, it's a, it's a nice feeling to be in the community that we can serve people that uh, they can raise their own hogs and hunt beef and bring them here and not have to worry where their next meal is going to come from. So we're trying in our little own way to, to help that problem. And for the rights, that's the most important thing, working hard to provide a good service and product to those in their community. Making sure the customer gets a good product, 
uh, that's what drives us to get up every morning knowing and, and we leave at the end of the day with a good feeling and knowing we created a good product that, that somebody can take home to their family and use. Reporting in Somerville for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. John, thanks so much. Well, buckle your seatbelts because when we come back, we are kicking up the horsepower and taking you from the harvester to this piece of muscle machinery and the peanut farmer who drives both of them. Stay tuned. My name is Ralph Sandiford. I'm from third generation farmer from Midville, Georgia. Started farming right after I graduated from the University of Georgia in 1981. On our farm, we've been pretty consistent growing cotton, peanuts, corn. We got some pecan trees. Been sticking with pretty much the same rotation now for all these years, and it's been very successful for us. One of the things that we're really learning is Every day is a challenge to us. We, if you think you've learned it all in farming, especially peanuts, you're going to get in trouble. You've got to start paying attention to what Extension is doing for us and, and the new technology and all that's coming out there because things change every day. So you can't just go to sleep and think you've got it figured out because tomorrow it will be different. Over the 40 years, uh, probably the biggest change has been computers. Uh, every tractor has a computer on it. I was more of the mechanical type all my life and enjoyed it, but now I've got a, my son who graduated from Georgia, Jacob. He's back here and farming me, fourth generation, and he likes that side of it. So it's really worked out well for us to have both sides on the farm to keep it going. One of the things we've learned in farming it, it, that I noticed when my son was with me, Jacob was out there with me one day and we were talking about it. And he said, what's that blank, that spot in that field out there that nothing's growing? And I said, well, what's happening is our land is eroding away. So in the last eight years, we have gone to complete cover crops. And back then, people growing peanuts said, you can't grow cover crops and turn around and put peanuts in those cover crops. Well, since then, it has really rolled over that growing peanuts in cover crop is really working good for us. We're, we're saving moisture. Um, it makes the peanuts easier to dig. We're just having all kind of good luck with that. And fertilizers don't wash away. The land is not nearly as erodible as it was. So to pass it on, Jacob's really realizing that we've got to take better care of our soil. We're, so we're really working down the road of, of building the fields up as we're going. It's my favorite time of the year when we start flipping the peanuts over, getting them on top of the ground. That smell out there is just a, a wonderful thing. And, watching the harvesters run and, and dumping it all on the trailers and watching them pile up. That's just the greatest time of the year, watching harvest and know that you produced a crop. Um, good Lord's been, been blessed, been giving it to us. We've been really blessed in growing crops, and we know this year we got another one good one coming, and we're really excited about it. For Damascus farmer Jeff Atkinson, at times, life on the farm can feel like it's moving at a snail's pace, laid back, relaxing. He enjoys his tractors, loves hearing this sound. But when he's not farming, this sound here really gets his heart racing, literally. My dad did it for years, um, I've, so I tagged along with him, uh, always intrigued by it, always uh, wanted to learn more as we got along, uh, started doing it on my own, when I, or started doing it, started driving his car at 16, uh, drove it for several years and 
uh, had a little bit of success, but as a young kid, your head's not in the right place. You're, you're better than everybody else. But eventually, Jeff matured, his ego left in the dust, so to speak, and now he's a regular on the NHRA professional drag circuit, traveling the country all while promoting Georgia Peanuts and the Georgia Peanut Commission, one of his sponsors. Everybody knows me as the Peanut Man. Uh, we go to the races. One of the first questions we get asked him when we're in uh, Minnesota or California or anywhere like that is, uh, hurry up and get unloaded so you can get the peanuts out. Uh, they all want, want uh, they love the samples of peanuts that we bring. It's a good fit for me. They can hire someone, I mean, they can sponsor someone else, but they can't really give them firsthand information on the peanut, on the growing, the sustainability, profitability, the uh, protein value, everything else. They can't do that the way that I can. Some of the silly questions we've been asked about peanuts over the years is, um, do you have to plant them every year? Do they grow on trees? Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been very enlightening for me. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy going around the country promoting peanuts. Peanuts, though, just a small portion of Jeff's extensive operation. As part owner of JDA Farms, along with his wife and daughter, Jeff also grows cotton, corn, soybean, and wheat in Miller, Baker, and Early County. Yes, he loves the rumble of a powerful engine, but long before he got behind the wheel of a race car, Jeff was driving tractors. Uh, my earliest memories are me five, six, seven years old, Huge baseball cap, the cap's way bigger than my head, me on a tractor. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, several of the old men said that they saw the hat way before they did me on a tractor. Um, I was so small till I had to take the, both hands, pull on the bottom of the steering wheel to smash the clutch or the brakes to stop. Um, it was, but I knew immediately that playing in the dirt was what I wanted to do. <laughs> take me inside the cab of both. Tell me that feeling when you start up the cab for that peanut harvester, and tell me that feeling when you start up that race car. Two totally different deals. I want the cab with the tractor to be just as quiet as possible. I don't play a radio, I don't play anything like that. I want to be able to hear the hum of the machine and make sure that everything is uh, operating properly behind me, whatever I'm doing. Uh, in a race car, I want to hear a lot of noise. Uh, yeah, you're listening for, uh, problems that may occur with both. So there's a lot of similarities. Um, it's uh, uh, the rush that you get with the race cars, uh, indescribable. The racing's pretty simple. When I don't feel like I'm competitive anymore, when I don't feel like I can do it, I'll quit. I'm not gonna go out there and uh, and just be a number. I'm, I Right now, I still feel like I can compete with anybody out there. So I'm going to continue to do that. Uh, the farming, I would like to slow down. Uh, but as far as completely quitting, I don't see myself doing that for a long, long time. Yeah, he's pretty much the poster child for cool, isn't he? Stay with us. The Farm Monitor continues right after this quick break. Welcome and thank you for coming to the ribbon cutting ceremony of the People's Garden. We're going to be replicating this across this country. We have about 17 locations right now that we're going to have these gardens. We're going to have more. And I think as rural meets urban, these are the things that we have to do. You know, we call it the People's Garden in part because Abe Lincoln, when he established the department in 1862, referred to the Department of Agriculture as the People's Department. This is going to be a place that's going to attract a lot of attention. A lot of people are going to come here. They're going to take a look at the amazing array of agricultural products that are being grown here. 
they'll read the information that's being provided and they'll get a sense. When you grow gardens like this, you create a more resilient food system. It helps to address food security needs in communities. Our hope is that it inspires others to go back to their communities to start something like this. And we hope that a few young people who come by here think, hey, I wonder what's going on in that building over there. I wonder what kind of activity and opportunity they might have if I worked at USDA. Or maybe it's going to spur someone to think about, well, how could you do this better? How could we continue the innovation of American agriculture? And hopefully it will also encourage all of us that we need to do our part to mitigate the consequences of a changing climate and that we're sensitive to that. And with that, I'm supposed to cut the ribbon. Two, three, it's officially open. All right. Finally this week, from our friends at the Georgia Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association comes the story of Beth McQuaig McIntyre, a blueberry grower from South Georgia and owner of Anna's Garden Blueberries. My favorite time is when I can pick the first blueberry and then a bittersweet time is when the season is over and I've picked the last blueberry off the bush and I know I won't be able to come back anymore. I'm Beth McQuig McIntyre and I'm in the middle of a rabbit eye blueberry field in Wilcox County, Georgia. And we have been growing blueberries for eight years we started out with four acres, and now we have 74 acres of high bush and rabbit eye blueberries. To me, the soil in Georgia is ideal for blueberries. It is sandy, loamy clay. You can have your soil tested. Where we are in Wilcox County, we have sandy, loamy soil. It was initially pine tree land. It had a lot of good acidity to it. So for our farm, that is what makes blueberries good. There's nothing better for a source of vitamin C than blueberries. Also, antioxidants are in blueberries. They're available to you year round fresh or frozen. Of course, fresh are usually preferred, but we also have frozen from our farm all year, year long. This year for us, we opted to use our harvester 100% of the time. So all of the berries that we have harvested this year have been done by the harvester, which for me, and for as far as food safety goes, that is much safer than a lot of different hands touching the blueberries. So no hands touch the blueberries, really, until we get to the packing plant, and then they have gloves on, and they have masks and hairnets and sleeves. So. In my way of thinking, we made a decision to go with the harvester as a food safety measure as well as a cost saving measure. I can run the harvester with five people rather than having 85 people in my field. So it's a matter of economics there. Now, we just have a 74-acre farm, so in the big picture, we are just a little drop in the bucket. But we want to be a good drop in the bucket, and we also want to be a productive farm, which we think we are. We're a relatively new farm. So out of the $300 million that is the economic impact of blueberries in Georgia, we might just be a little drop. However, it takes all of us working together to provide that $300 million to the state of Georgia. I'm Beth McQuaig McIntyre, and I'm very proud to be a blueberry farmer in Georgia. Beth, thanks so much, and thank you for making the show possible. Take care, stay safe, have a great week.